September 12, 1988 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council and I'd like to begin by asking the town clerk to call the roll. Frank Latore. Present. Jane Amaral. Here. Phyllis Carso. Here. Wayne Crailman. Here. Janet Greenlaw. Here. William Jordan. Yeah. Nancy Masterton. Here. Very good. Uh, I would like to see if anyone would like to make a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting that we had on August 8, 1988 that were included in our packet this evening. So it's, been moved, it's been moved and seconded to accept the minutes of the August 8th meeting. All those in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, it passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda is citizens' discussion of items that are not on this agenda. So if there are any citizens that are in the audience here this evening that would like to speak on something other than we have on our agenda items 30, 31 through 41, now is the time to step forward. We also have a time at the end of each meeting where citizens can discuss items that are not on the agenda as well. So I would open it up at this point. If there are any citizens wishing to discuss anything? Seeing none coming forward, we'll move on to the next item, which is reports and correspondence. Uh, of, the, of our fellow councilors here. Does anyone have any reports or correspondence that they wish to bring forward, either on any committees that they may sit on or the like? Yes, Councilor Jordan. I, I got a couple of things here that are not uh, on about a committee. I would just like to have the manager write a letter to the Spray Corporation and care less of Jordan for cutting the brush and making the visibility much better at, up by the Spilling Church. When you come around the corner coming from Scarborough, now you can see the other vehicle before you get to Spunk Avenue. And it was a tremendous deal as far as visibility goes. I don't know whose responsibility it would be the state of the town, but I see their crew doing it, and I think we ought to send a note and thank them for doing it. The other thing I got is uh, I think we ought to have the manager get in touch with the main track club. This road race they had Sunday, I got two complaints and the police department got two calls with three complaints with uh, the runners, two abreast, taking up uh, half of the road is the ones that I got. And the other one was up the Spring Church where they were uh, rooting on their runner. There was quite a crowd there and it was quite noisy. And also they got such a crowd that you had to go out around them because they worked their way out into the street. The police department ones was obscenities that they had spoke to the people along the, these are the runners, the people along the way, and also the littering of cops along the street wasn't cleaned up when they get down. And I would recommend the manager get in touch with the president and have them clean their act up or run in another community. Okay, very good. It's been duly noted. Councilor Creelman? Creelman? Yes, I had a request from uh, Robert Kinley, uh, Cape Elizabeth resident. With regard to the Kettle Cove uh, parking lot, uh, recognizing over the last summer things have moved very smoothly there with uh, the new signs and uh, everyone seems to have gotten along very well. Uh, one problem that does seem to uh, surface on particularly busy days uh, is parking in that parking lot. Uh, and the, uh, the opinion, at least by some, is that if we had lines that were painted in the parking lot uh, designating one spot for one car, uh, perhaps we could open up several more uh, spaces uh, in the current way that cars are parked. Uh, this is apparently not owned by Cape Elizabeth. This is owned by the state, the actual parking lot. But uh, I'd like to request the town manager to at least look into the possibility of lining that parking lot, looking at pros and cons uh, of the uh, project. Okay, very good. Yes. I have a copy Council of the letter Council. I received from Mr. Alan Atkins in reference to the town of Cape Elizabeth considering the establishment of a National Lighthouse Museum at the fort. He is not in support of the idea. Like, I think I. You have it in your packet. Mm -hmm. well. mm -hmm. Councilor Amor? Uh, I also received a letter from Mr. Atkinson. I don't know if other councilors did, but they probably did. But I would like to just briefly report to you as your representative on the Executive Committee of the Fort Regional Council of Governments that the Council of Governments uh, this year is uh, setting up for the first time a legislative advocacy committee 
uh, which means that uh, we, as one of the 21 member communities, will be working together to try to uh, educate uh, legislators in Augusta as to what is happening uh, in Cumberland County, basically. And our thrust this year is going to be property tax relief. So uh, I expect that uh, uh, you'll be hearing more from me about uh, the advocacy uh, activities of COG in the next few months. But uh, we will be set, set, setting up a special committee to uh, uh, look at the, the legislative bills uh, as they are proposed uh, in the coming session. Uh, and Cape Elizabeth will be asked, as other communities will be, to send a representative to that committee. So I'll be letting you know more about uh, what the process for electing a member to the committee will be, uh, as that is determined in the next week or so. Very good. Thank you. If, if there's no others, I would like to make a report on some correspondence that we received regarding uh, Channel 7, which is the community access television station here in Cape Elizabeth. I'd like to read part of a letter that was written by Tom Rutledge, who's the president of a public cable company, to the town manager, Michael McGovern. And it begins by saying, on October 3rd, 1988, public cable will launch a new basic service free to all customers called Turner Network Television, or TNT as it'll be called. When we launch Turner Network Television, continues the letter, we'll be launching TNT on Channel 7, which is currently occupied in Cape Elizabeth by the Access Channel. We intend to move the Cape Elizabeth Access Channel from Channel 7 to Channel 38 uh, when TNT is launched on October 3rd. So I did want to at least make the announcement that this is the last town council meeting that will be carried on Channel 7, and I know our loyal fans will follow us wherever we go, but I wanted our loyal fans to know that we're going to Channel 38. I also wanted to see if there were any comments at this time from any councillors regarding this move. Um, I understand that there isn't anything that we can do about it other than express now what, what our opinions might be on it. My only opinion that I wanted to give was it's a little unfortunate that we had less than a month to find out about this from September 7th when we're notified to October 3rd when the move is, although I am thankful to Mr. Rutledge who continues in his letter on about that he will help us advertise it in the Cape Courier, Portland Press Herald and other places so that our citizenry will know. Um, my, I guess my other feeling is we are getting established on 7. There's a lot of hard work going on. We're, up, we're really starting to firm up our commitment to this station, and I feel it's most unfortunate that we have to move just when we're starting to get some momentum going. And I hope people will tell the word, tell your neighbors that, that we're still on the air, but we'll be on Channel 38. Are there any other comments? Any other councilors there? Councilor Amaro? Yeah, just one comment. I think you're right that our loyal fans will probably find us on 38. However, <coughs> Being on Channel 7, it's been kind of nice because people just flip and flip, uh, find us when they don't expect to. And I've watched for a few moments. So I, I'm upset, really, that we're going to be moved to the far end of the dial on Channel 38. And I know we, uh, all we can do is uh, give our opinions because Public Cable certainly has the right to do what they've done. But we've been bounced around quite a bit, not just the channel, but with other issues uh, with Public Cable. Uh, Things seem to change very quickly with uh, much input from us. We receive a letter saying this is going to be done, and then that's it, it's done. Yeah. We have very, very little time to react. So that's, I just would like to say that I'm not happy with the move. Uh, I like it right where we are in town. I wish we could stay. I thought we had found a home here. Well, perhaps we. Perhaps I could send a letter to just expressing those those opinions, if that would be a consensus of the council, for me to I do so as chairman. Okay, I'd be glad to draft a letter with Michael and send each of you a copy of that letter. Okay, if there's no other further discussion, we'll move on to the first uh, agenda item, which is item 31, to consider a recommendation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission regarding a proposed Lighthouse Celebration 200 at Fort Williams Park on August 5th, 6th, and 7th, 1989, and take any necessary action. I'd like to read briefly from a memo that was sent by the Lighthouse Preservation Society to the Fort Williams Committee regarding this Lighthouse Celebration 200. It states, uh, in 1989, 1989 marks the 200th anniversary of the act that established our national lighthouse system. To commemorate this event, the Lighthouse Preservation Society, in conjunction with other lighthouse preservation organizations and the National Historic Trust, has proposed that an appropriate celebration be planned. The U.S. Coast Guard supports this project also. Since the Portland Headlight was the first lighthouse to be completed under this act, and due to its national popularity, accessibility, and beauty, it is the national choice for such a celebration. 
the Lighthouse Preservation Society has engaged Trident Associates of Brunswick to coordinate the celebration with all appropriate authority. The Society respectfully requests the Fort William Commission for their input and positive reaction, which the Society hopes that you will communicate to the Town Council. So this is somewhat of a background on this Lighthouse Celebration Day 200. And uh, you also have in your packet, my fellow councillors, the, the tentative schedule for these festivities, which, as you see, Friday would be more or less of a press conference kickoff type of uh, reception at the Portland Museum of Art. Saturday would be a theme exhibit festival day celebrating our maritime heritage. Sunday would focus basically around uh, perhaps a major concert with the Portland Symphony on Sunday night. And then Monday would be the actual ceremonies to uh, commemorate George Washington signing 200 years ago. I notice in the audience we have uh, Henry Adams, who's the chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. And we also have two representatives from Trident Associates in Brunswick. Mr. George Schnacke and Jim Towney, uh, Jim Tomney, excuse me. Uh, if anyone has any questions for either Trident Associates representing the uh, Lighthouse Preservation Society or for Mr. Adams and their discussion that ensued at the Fort Williams Advisory Committee meeting. Would anyone care to uh, begin the discussion on this? Mr. Chairman, yes, I don't Council have Jordan. any real discussion on it because I think it's a great thing for Dick Elizabeth to have the Portland Headlight picked as a uh, area for a celebration and also in Fort Williams and I think it's Jorgel Park and I would so recommend that we go ahead and uh, approve the recommendation of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee and set the wheels in motion for the celebration in 1989. Second motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to accept the recommendation of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Councilor Masterton. Well, I, I have a question that I'd like to ask probably uh, from the representative, representative of Trident. Um, do you have any idea, or does the Lighthouse Preservation Society have any idea how many people uh, this celebration is going to attract to Fort Williams. Could you come to the microphone sure. so those at home could hear you as well? <coughs> I'm George Schnacke, and uh, I represent Trident Associates. Um, in terms of, of the numbers of people, um, we really have not made a firm estimate on that at this point. Uh, because we really have not firmed up the entire program. And I think it's a function of how we end up uh, putting the program together. For instance, the symphony, if we are able to get them, which now looks fairly promising, could be a very good draw. And we might have as many as 15,000 people come out for the symphony, uh, in which case we would be in a position then to provide parking and outside of town and to bring people in and try to handle it. Uh, within the confines and within the guidelines that uh, Mr. Adams and our group have talked about. If I might continue. Mm -hmm. This is a national celebration. Yes. So that uh, this will be advertised nationally. Advertised. Uh, there will be national publicity on it, I'm sure, yes. Um, and so we would expect many, many out-of-staters to be coming into the state of Maine. It's not just a celebration for the greater Portland area or Cumberland County. No, but that's going to be the major emphasis will be here in, in our local area. That will be where the major emphasis comes from, yes. But at that time of year, we're going to have pretty good crowds anyway. And I don't think we're going to be drawing people making a special trip for that one day or two day celebration. I think we're going to get the natural flow of people who are already in the area. And you are planning to have some sort of um, busing available from SMVTI and some other? That is one of the locations, yes, from the mall, from uh, uh, SMVTI's parking lots. We've already talked to them. Wayne Ross has worked with us on our planning committee. And as I say, a lot of these things are, are things that we are now in the process of working out with a planning group of people from Cape Elizabeth with Mr. Adams, uh, with the people on the, on the uh, Fort Williams Commission. 
and a lot of those things are still a little bit nebulous, but yes, we will make provisions to bus people in or to bring them in by public transportation. Because I think one thing that the town does not want is bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic on Shore Road coming from both, both ends and uh, no place to put the cars in the fort. I think that that's a very good point, and, and we are very much aware of that, and that has been one of the major considerations that we've discussed and will be discussing at each of our meetings, and it's not going to get lost, I promise you that. Uh, Mr. Tomney, who is my associate, lives in Cape Elizabeth, and he's very much aware of what those kind of problems can do, and we just that's not what we need. We want to use the park as the right kind of a setting without wall-to-wall -wall people and without wall-to-wall -wall cars uh, for this celebration. And in order to do that, we're going to have to be very careful about the logistics. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Cogshaw. Is there going to be um, a point for the town to review your final proposal to see if we would find it acceptable, traffic, um, your concessions, or by approving this celebration, are you just basically on your own? At this point, you are, we are asking you to approve the concept of doing the celebration at the fort. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a committee, which is already being formulated, of local citizens, people from Cape Elizabeth, who will be working with us. We will be in constant contact with the Fort Williams people. Um, Frank, has been, Mr. Latoria, has been very much involved with our planning to date. We will keep he and, and Michael aware of it. And I think you know, there will be enough publicity about what we're doing. We're not planning to do anything under the dark of night. And uh, we need all of the input that we can get and all of the help we can get. And because this is something that's very important and we want it to come off as a very enjoyable kind of activity for everyone involved. And uh, we all, we live in Maine, we're involved, we're not from away, and we don't want any, uh, any problems of any kind. And it's gonna take some doing to do it. And frankly, uh, one of the things that I keep having a lot of people give me trouble about this, but I keep saying, you know, it's only 11 months and 10 days until this celebration, so we've got a lot of work to do. But we're planning to cover as, every detail we can possibly think of, so we need all the help we can get. Yes, how's the green line? Mr. Schnacki, yes. I do want to tell you I'm very much in favor of this celebration. I think it's an honor for the town to be in this position to help host the celebration. I do have a concern, however, prompted in part by the Lighthouse letter that was received, I believe, from the Lighthouse Preservation Society. And the date on this is fall, winter 1987. The picture of Portland headlights saying that that will be the site of the celebration. That was a year ago. I just find that a rather presumptuous statement. I hope care will be taken that statements like that are not coming across my table in the future anyway. And I hear you talking about having dialogue with Cape Elizabeth residents. I noticed in the proposed schedule of events that there are a number of parts of this celebration being planned for South Portland. And I would urge you to have them, either South Portland um, city officials or others along, say, the road race route involved in your planning I hear you talking about conversations with SMVTI. I'm very glad to hear about that. I would urge you to take heed of Councillor Jordan's comments about the road race. Mm -hmm. that we yes, I heard those. Witnessed in Cable mm -hmm. Very yesterday. good point. Very good point, and yes. To urge you to work with some of the landowners mm -hmm. in that area. One that comes mm -hmm. to my mind is the McCourt Company, which has large land holdings yes. near Bug Light. Right. We have, we have worked with Dana Anderson, who is the Commissioner of Parks and Recreation in South Portland, and we have a very good working relationship with both he and the town manager. Uh, they are aware of this project. I did not mention them in my earlier comments, but yes, that's an excellent point, and we're not in any way trying to eliminate anybody from being involved in this, and we certainly want all the input we can. That newsletter that you are referring to, frankly, has a number of other embarrassing little <laughs> comments in it. So all I can say is I'm sorry. It, it was premature. And we'll be trying to make sure we don't have those things happen again. I have another question for the manager, perhaps. Um, what would be the town's financial commitment? <coughs> there would be no direct financial commitment. The Lighthouse Preservation Society would be anticipated to pick up all 
cost for public works, uh, police, uh, all out-of-pocket expenses. You know, I think anything like this, uh, we do have certain in-kind contributions, uh, use of the facilities, et cetera. Uh, the Fort Williams Committee has left open uh, what the what the parking fee would be uh, pending uh, a later review of how the the day's plans are continuing. And a question that was raised to me by a citizen when they saw the outline of proposed events was the laser show. Do we have to allow laser, laser shows at Fort Williams? <coughs> so that has been raised as a concern. My response was I didn't know. We, we have never had a request for a laser show. Uh, you know, it would be something I'm sure we'd look into with the state fire marshal's office mm -hmm. and the local fire department. If I, if I might just comment to, to the laser show, again, that is an idea, and it might work, it might not. It is totally harmless. It is strictly a decorative effect that is projected against the fireworks and against the, the lighting backdrop that the fireworks um, set up when they when they set off one of the large displays and uh, it's a counterpoint to the fireworks it was done very successfully um, at the Expo 86 I guess in Vancouver and that was the first time it was used and it was perfectly harmless but it just it's a quite quite an interesting effect if it can be done Thank you. Councillor Amaro yeah uh, just uh, as a matter of clarification I did receive a couple of calls this morning from people who saw the headline in Saturday night's paper highlighting this item that was on our agenda. Uh, people confusing this with a letter from uh, the chairman of the council which appeared earlier in the week discussing the possibility of a national uh, lighthouse museum uh, at the port. Uh, and the people who called me thought that we would be voting on this museum tonight. I just wanted to make everybody uh, feel comfortable that we are not voting on uh, the Lighthouse becoming a national museum tonight. We have lots of discussion to do before that uh, is considered so that tonight's vote is only on this celebration, uh, this three-day celebration, which will take place in August of next year. Thank you. Are there any other comments? I would like to point out again uh, the fact that Trident and the Lighthouse Preservation Society is putting together this committee, this local committee. If any counselors have any names of someone that you, they think would be a, an active person, this, I think this committee is going to be a steering committee to give guidance to them, to give some local input, and also to provide volunteers and some assistance as, as some of these de events start to develop. If you have some names or you yourself would care to serve on it in a capacity just as a private citizen, please let me know because we'll be glad to take more hands on deck, as they say, because I think it's, it is going to be a lot of work to pull it off. And, and the more citizen local input, I think, the better in terms of meeting a lot of our own needs from the town. So just to point, emphasize that point again. <coughs> if there's no further discussion, we could have a vote on the motion that's been made and seconded regarding accepting the Fort Williams Advisory Committee's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. All those in favor of the recommendation? Any opposed? So it passes unanimously that we endorse the site as being the site for the Lighthouse Celebration Day 200. Thank you once again for coming, everyone, on that issue. We'll move along to item 32, which is to consider referring to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission responsibility for reviewing the status of the Portland Headlight property and take any necessary action. I'd like to make a few introductory comments on this, on this item. On August 16, 1988, Henry Adams, who's the chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee, and Michael McGovern met with Captain Underwood, who's the commander of the U.S. Coast Guard in Portland. And also at that meeting was uh, Lieutenants Yeomans and Dufresne. The U.S. Coast Guard is planning to automate the Portland headlight sometime in late 1989 or early 1990. So a major issue which will be before us, or before the Coast Guard first, is whether or not they're going to continue to use the Portland headlight for housing. Captain Underwood indicated at this August 16th meeting that he believed that it probably would not be used for housing because of what he called the fishbowl atmosphere there. Uh, obviously, it's not exactly the most private place in the world to live in, and uh, though it is a beautiful place to live, and I guess this fishbowl atmosphere is, is leaning towards no longer will it be used for housing. It's my impression from those that attended that I talked to the meeting, they said that good communication has been established now between the town and the Coast Guard, and they'll keep us up to date as to what the different possibilities as they're unfolding could be for this property. 
five possibilities for the property could be that the coast guard could continue to use it for housing or that the coast guard could use it for other purposes or the coast guard could sell it outright or the coast guard may lease it or the coast guard may rent it so these are options that have been being toyed around with and, and i believe that it's a good time for the town to begin giving some serious thought as to what would we want to do with that property should it become available to us in either purchase lease or be there some cape elizabeth input into control and running of that property um, and in, it's in that spirit that i would suggest giving the fort williams advisory committee responsibility for reviewing the status of the portland headlight property and reviewing po all possible options for this site should cape elizabeth gain control of the property the manager has suggested, and I agree with him, that January would be a good time to ask the Fort Williams Advisory Committee to get back to us on this, giving them uh, several months to, to hold hearings, to discuss it, and, and to uh, look at the different options that could be available to them. So this is the spirit in which I, I offer this as a motion before the council to have it officially go to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee for study at this time. Also move. It's been moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. One comment. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, all I want to say is that uh, I'm very much in favor of referring this to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee, but I would hope before any sound decisions were made that we would be brought up to date on what's taken place and that this is only advisory only. Yes, did, thank you. Council Master. Did, did you say, Frank, that January 1 would be the reporting day? That we would ask them to get back to us with a report sometime in January, I would say. Do you, do you think that's time enough? They, even if it was just, I was thinking, even if it was just a progress report on, on what had been discussed, had any options been looked at, had any groundwork been laid, you know. If, it doesn't, if it's not a final report, I think they could ask us for, for more time. And we hear from the chairman on the feasibility of that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Adams, chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Committee. Been dropping at the bit to get. <laughs> <laughs> Briefly. What did you say? Brief. 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 Briefly. Briefly. Okay. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we're having our first meeting uh, on this subject. Uh, not only have we got the buildings and the property at Portland Headlight to review, but there, we've got a shopping list of about 30 items that we want to discuss. Uh, the manager and I have developed a timeline. Hopefully, uh, we're going to get cost estimates in the middle of October on uh, our shopping list of problems and things that have got to be done at Fort Williams Park. On November 1st, uh, the town administration is going to prepare an outline, we hope, by November 1st. Uh, to give us a picture of the total cost of running Fort Williams Park. You know, there's not only the budget for the for Fort Williams Commission, but there's also uh, parks and police and, and uh, all the ancillary activities, and we want to know what the total cost is. Then on November 15th, we're planning to hold a public meeting here in the council chambers, at which time we're going to invite the interested committees of the town and the townspeople to solicit input into all of these items, including the property at Portland Headlight. And hopefully between November 15th and November tw uh, January 12, 1989, we could prepare some type of report for the town council. As uh, uh, Councilor Latoria said, even if it's only a preliminary report, we will hopefully have something by that time. Uh, it's, going to t it's a tremendous undertaking, and it's something that uh, uh, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, is very anxious to get a hold of, and I think that uh, by referring all of this material to us, it's, it's the right direction to go. Uh, I'm in constant contact with the Coast Guard. I, as a matter of fact, I go over there once a month for lunch, and I was over there uh, this noon for lunch and talked to Captain Underwood, to Lieutenant Commander Dufresne, and to Lieutenant Yeomans and, uh, uh, concerning this. So, in fact, I didn't talk to them. They came and talked to me, so that... Uh, I outranked them all, so that's probably <laughs> right. uh, But, you know, uh, just, I have something. Th in this envelope is everything concerning, this is probably the most extant collection, private collection of Fort Williams that ever exists in the town of Cape Elizabeth. And uh, I just want to read something, Frank, and the rest of you that uh, I think you'd be interested in hearing, because it's apropos to the, uh, the length of time it may take to do this. 
But uh, in the middle of this thing, I have, a, I have a letter that was dated December of 1977, okay? It's at the time when the uh, council was considering low-income housing for Fort Williams. And the letter is from Sarah K. Boxer. Dear Mr. Adams, I happened to be council chairman at the time. Uh, Dear Mr. Adams, I understand that the council is presently considering low-income housing as a possible use for a portion of Fort Williams. Such use would clearly be contrary to the desires of a majority of the Cape residents as well as the studied views of the Fort Williams Committee. Any new proposal for the fort should not proceed without a full opportunity with ample public notice for all Cape citizens to be informed of and comment on any such proposal. I would like my comments to be noted by the council. I hope the council would, on any issue, strive for maximum citizen participation on issues which the council knows are of concern to a great many residents. Sincerely, Sarah K. Boxer. Uh, and this is exactly the way we're going to approach this. It's, it's a, it, this is a probably a very serious decision that's got to be made. We've got to come up with some alternatives for use of the, uh, the buildings. And I know that the Fort Williams Advisory Commission is is, is raring to go. Uh, and I had a long conversation with someone today, she's, she's in the audience tonight, uh, Jerry Edgar, and she brought out a very good uh, point that before our public hearing on, uh, public meeting, we want to call it, on November 15th, we really should have quite an educational uh, process in the Cape Courier so that people coming to the meeting won't ask questions for the first time. They will already have a lot of information. So when they come to the meeting, their questions and their input would be very helpful and very in, of a high intelligent level. So that uh, if you vote uh, for us to do this, we'll accept the challenge very, very graciously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Digging out that letter as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Councilor Greenlaw. Um, I would like to request that the manager forward to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission all letters received by councilors either for or against the idea of the museum being a, a museum being in Fort Williams. And I would make note to Mr. Adams that the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, I believe, has expressed desire in helping to see that the Coast Guard property stays within the boundaries, the control, whatever we, however we want to phrase it, of the town of Cape Elizabeth and would encourage you to request their input further, perhaps. Yeah, for your information, I have no contact with Matt Clifford concerning this, and we're going to send out invitations to the various boards and commissions, and uh, we're also going to send an invitation to uh, Matt Clifford. Let's end the meeting on the 15th. Thank you. Any further comment or questions or... Okay, seeing none, then we would uh, have a vote. Would be in order on item 32, which has been moved and seconded to uh, accept referring the fact of referring to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee responsibility for reviewing the status of the Portland Headlight property. All those in favor? Any opposed? None. So it passes unanimously, seven to zero. We know that you are chomping at the bit, ready, willing, and able to serve. And thank you very kindly. Thank your committee too. We'll move on now to item 33. Item 33 is to consider a report from the Board of Sewer Appeals regarding a request from Edward and Janice Drynan for a sewer extension and take any necessary action. I'd ask our town manager, Mike McGovern, to fill us in briefly on this item. Yes, I will be very brief. On July 6th, the town council received a request from Janice and Edward Drynan for a sewer extension for a proposed uh, development uh, of 18 units or, or for what might eventually be a proposed development of 18 units. The request for the sewer extension, it, it's somewhat hard to describe the area, but it's essentially uh, off Spurwink Avenue around uh, what I would call the bad turn down near the South Portland line. Uh, it's in back of uh, the private road Stevenson Street and is also in the back of Leiden Lane, uh, which, is, which is off Mitchell Road. Uh, the, the town council at the July meeting did refer the issue to the Board of Sewer Appeals and the Board of Sewer Appeals met uh, on August 25th of 1988 uh, to, the re to review the request. Uh, at that meeting, they had a, a letter by the town attorney on the issue, uh, which they reviewed. Uh, the town engineer was present and related some issues uh, related to capacity and 
also, of course, the one of the applicants was present, uh, as well as uh, the attorney for the applicant. Uh, the recommendation of the Board of Sewer Appeals uh, at that meeting uh, was, uh, I will read from the minutes, uh, that was moved by uh, one of the members and seconded by another, that based on the data provided on potential flows, this board would recommend granting, granting the extension for 18 sewers. Uh, we do recognize the possibility that capacity may be exceeded under exceptional circumstances. I won't rehash the issue. I think uh, most of it is, is before the town council uh, this evening and the background materials you do have. Would, I would like to mention that David Bridges, the chairman of the Board of Sewer Appeals, is here tonight as well as uh, John Roberts, uh, a member, uh, Tom Leahy, the town attorney, Joel Martin, the attorney uh, for the appellants, and uh, Ed Drine and... Uh, Appellant isn't the right word. Applicant. Uh, and uh, Edward Drine, uh, one of the applicants. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin by asking if there's anyone in the public <coughs> that would care to speak on this issue of item number 31 at this time. Yes. Cal Fritz? Yes. <coughs> the public section is open now for discussion. I'm, I'm Carol Fritz, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Cape Elizabeth unit of the League of Women Voters. Back in the 70s, for nearly two years, the members of the League did a thorough study of the need for expanding the sewer system in Cape Elizabeth. At the end of the study in 1979, we concluded that in order to be environmentally responsible, the town needed to adopt a policy of minimal sewering for the purpose of correcting existing problems. We concluded that there needed to be built a new sewage treatment plant with ocean outfall to replace the old Spurwink plant, which had become ov overburdened and was increasingly forced to bypass by dumping raw sewage into the marsh. Also, that plant facilities not be provided for any currently undeveloped area except for a very limited number of fill-in lots and that strict zoning and sewer ordinances be adopted and enforced to ensure that subsurface disposal systems would function successfully in all sewered areas and in future developments. Many individuals and committees in Cape Elizabeth have worked extremely hard to develop the town's current sewer policy. We agree with that policy, particularly as it fairly allocates the remaining limited sewer capacity to landowners along the sewer line. We urge the Council to deny the request before you tonight since it would undermine the carefully worked out policy developed through many years of heated debate in Cape Elizabeth over the sewers. And if I might change hats uh, to speak as an individual who has served on a number of committees that have deliberated over the sewer issue. Uh, as most of you are aware, there are a couple of, of new ones that may not, uh, among you, that may not have been here during all of the um, discussions we've had on the sewers. Um, we have had at least three different size plans for the sewers. Uh, we started back in 1972 recognizing the need for a sewer, particularly in, uh, well, in, in the entire town. We ended up building the system in 1978 for the northern system, and we saw a great deal of growth uh, take place after 1978 when that northern system went into effect. At the same time, we kept adding a little bit at a time to the Spurwink treatment plant, pushing it over the edge so uh, that when it rained and we had a big storm, we were bypassing to the marsh more and more all the time starting out in about in, in 78 or so when I was on the planning board, we were maybe bypassing one or two days a year. And then by the time I got off the board in, in 85, I think we were many, many days in about three different months over the years. Uh, the comprehensive plan in 1980 was certainly uh, the overriding issue was the impact of the sewers on growth in, in Cape Elizabeth. After realizing the amount of growth that could be um, brought in by sewers, the town council 
proposed a smaller plan for the Southern Cape. Many thought in the, in the town that it was still too big and still too expensive, and we had a referendum. The referendum won, so we were back to square one again with having, having to uh, realize that there was still a problem, but we had the residents seem to feel that it, it was too expensive and would provide too much growth. The town set up a sewer study committee. That sewer study committee worked for a couple of years, and they made a number of very substantial recommendations, again proposing that the size of the system be downsized in order to only take care of existing problems and uh, fill in growth. Their recommendations were that the town set up another committee which would define what fill-in growth meant and what those fees were. The town adopted the recommendations of the sewer study committee and it went to referendum again. This time the town residents, we assume, um, decided that that plan was all right and, and it was adopted. Uh, after the town finally agreed to that southern sewer plan, um, the sewer advisory committee was set up to implement the recommendations and, and two of the, the more important things I think that we did uh, and a committee that I served on was setting up new fees and, and finding out a definition for fill-in growth which is the policy that you have before you, you've adopted and uh, that committee worked extremely hard working in constant uh, consulting, having the advice of the, the town engineer, the town attorney, um, in order to implement an orderly way to define the fill-in growth based on the remaining capacity in the treatment plant. Some of the major things that I think that the committee really wanted to consider was that the policy be consistent throughout the town, that we not have one policy for the south and one for the north, that we fairly allocate that remaining capacity. Uh, prior to the adoption of the current policy, it, it, it was a, on a first come first serve basis. If someone came in with a development proposal, then other people who might have been able to connect to the sewer would be out of luck because the capacity had been reached. So allocating along the lines of the sewer seemed to be a very fair policy in allowing landowners to have access to the sewer. And we were also warned that we, we should define fill-in growth not in an arbitrary way, but in a, in a very definite policy way in order to be able to stain, sustain our ordinances. Um, this proposal before you seems to be something that, that would be along the lines in my interpretation of an arbitrary decision. Um, <clears throat> this is the, the first request for a waiver uh, of this very carefully devised policy. And if granted, it would set a precedent for the whole town. Uh, and I think that you would continue to get request after request. Unfortunately, one of the recommendations of the sewer uh, advisory committee was that the sewer board, uh, appeals board would have a member of the board Having, having served in the past on either the sewer study committee or the sewer advisory committee so that there would be uh, some continuity so that we would know what the intent of the ordinance had been. And uh, unfortunately, I think that maybe one of the reasons that there was a favorable recommendation from the appeals board because they really might not have understood the intent of the ordinance. Um, so I would urge the Consul not to grant a waiver to this current sewer policy. If you allow more sewer connections to one developer than provided in the ordinance, then other landowners along the way will be cut short, 
which is basically unfair. If you succumb to the pressures of, one, of this one developer, you will be met with many additional requests. Adding a few connections at a time and not saving enough capacity for stormwater infiltration is precisely the policy that brought us into violation with the DEP as we dumped more and more untreated sewage into the marsh at the old Sperling treatment plant. It is in very important to keep in mind the need for space in any treatment plant for maximum stormwater storm water runoff and increased infiltration, which is likely as sewers age. It would be environmentally irresponsible to begin a policy that will set a precedent that would overburden the treatment plant and require bypassing in the future. And I think if you have been reading the series of articles in the Sunday Telegram concerning the health of the Casco Bay, um, partly due to sewage outfall into, into the bay, um, I hope you will deny this request. Thank you very much. We're continuing the public discussion now of item 33. Someone else? Yes. The grant of the Conservation Commission, although the Conservation Commission has not been made aware of, of this item and has not discussed it, uh, we have in the past had quite a lot of discussions about sewers uh, at the, putting together the last comprehensive plan. Uh, we're aware that there is a feeling that sewers should not control growth, and that's not a good way to control growth. And in fact, it should be controlled by good ordinances and by the uh, enforcement of those good ordinances. Yet, in fact, sewers do control growth, or at least they certainly accelerate it. I think the best example in town probably um, followed the placement of the Mitchell Road sewer when uh, right after that was done, uh, the planning board approved what was then the largest condominium development in the state of Maine, 99 units in Hobstone followed closely thereafter by two or three residential areas uh, and Cranbrook across the street, followed by Wildwood, which was hitched to that sewer, followed by the Oaks, and then followed by Stonegate. And all of those happened in relatively rapid uh, succession over the last uh, seven or eight, ten years. Sewers also relate to density. Cape Elizabeth soils do not support subsurface uh, disposal very well, and so for that reason we have a a, uh, uh, a zoning ordinance that requires uh, two acres minimum, 80,000 square feet minimum in zone RA where there are not sewers, but the presence of sewers quadruples that density to uh, um, have uh, one lot, uh, one residence per 20,000 square feet. This certainly was the concern of the last comprehensive planning committee, which dwelt heavily on fill-in growth, as Carol's. Carol has mentioned, and it is mentioned in the comprehensive plan, uh, the last one we had, that a final configuration for the Southern Cape sewer system, which allows for only minor infill growth, has been made. Conclusion, any density increases contemplated by sewer extensions beyond existing medium density residential districts should be accompanied through a program of permanent transferable development rights. Uh, so it seems that uh, it seems clear that, that uh, by granting a, an extension, uh, we, will, we will be setting a precedent uh, for a major impact on development throughout the town. Uh, this inaccurate map, which uh, I've put together very rapidly in the last couple of hours before the meeting, Uh, demonstrates as best as I was able to tell where, uh, where the major developments would occur uh, were you to set a precedent whereby individuals could, uh, could uh, ask for extensions of uh, the sewer. We're talking about this area right now, but there's no difference actually in, in uh, this 
uh, type of uh, a, uh, um, a lot than there would be in any of these other areas uh, in the Northern Cape system. And in fact, a couple of those are within the RC zone, uh, which would uh, bring uh, 20,000 square foot lots uh, to these areas here. And I added what was uh, also would apply to the Southern Cape sewer system. But really, there are a whole lot of arrows showing that once this thing starts, I know that there are capacity problems that you have to meet. There are other constraints on this. But once the process starts of accepting waivers uh, for expansions of the system, uh, this is what you're looking at, which essentially be the development of all undeveloped land in the town. I think this is a major decision that, that it seems to me, that, that you will be making tonight. And because of that, I think that the council uh, really should have some input from other uh, elements of the town, um, particularly the, the new Comprehensive Planning Committee, which I hope is also, uh, once again, wrestling with the sewer problem as we did the last time around. The planning board, not to admit, not the least uh, the the uh, Conservation Commission, and then the citizens themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward to speak on this? Yes. My name is uh, Edward Drynan. I am the uh, defendant, excuse me, uh, appellant, I'm sorry, petitioner. I'm the owner of a piece of land in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and I will introduce my attorney, Joel Martin, in just a minute. And if I could, Mr. Chairman, I would like to uh, speak again at the end of the proceeding if uh, I think it is necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, Mrs. Fritz and uh, Dr. Rand have uh, used a number of uh, phrases here just now. Um, and I will get to them in uh, just a minute. But I appeared before you in April uh, for a request uh, for an, an extension of the sewer line of the Northern Cape system for 39 units. You uh, referred that uh, to your sewer advisory committee. It thoroughly studied it for three months and refused my petition. I then went back before the council for a request for 18 units, a substantial reduction. The sewer committee again thoroughly examined the issue, the ordinances and the capacities, the history, and unanimously approved my request. Tonight, uh, we've heard phrases like the uh, Southern Cape treatment plant will be overburdened, Casco Bay will be polluted, overdevelopment and rapid growth. Uh, my request doesn't involve the Southern Cape treatment plant. It doesn't involve uh, burdening of the Southern Cape treatment plant, which will result in an overboard discharge in the Casco Bay. My request involves the Northern Cape system. Uh, my request uh, is for 18 uh, sewered uh, units. Uh, the land is zoned for up to 52 units. That is under development, not over development. My request is not a waiver. A waiver to me is like a favor. Uh, I am not asking for a waiver of anything. The ordinance is carefully written and uh, my request has been thoroughly reviewed. The word waiver never appeared uh, during our six months of discussions with the sewer board. My request does not involve an expansion of the system. It's impossible for me to request that. The ordinance uh, clearly uh, states that uh, the system is uh, allocated a certain number of gallons per day, and my request uh, clearly falls within that allotment. Uh, so I'm not asking for a waiver. I'm not asking for an expansion. I'm not asking for overdevelopment. And uh, I'd like to uh, speak to you again uh, later in the evening if I could. And right now I'd like to uh, introduce my attorney, Joel Martin, who would like to address a couple of the issues. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Joel Martin. I represent Janice and Ed Drynan. Um, I think it's important for you to know, because this is an important question, it's important for you to know what the question does not involve. And Ed has touched on some of those matters. It's not a waiver. There is no request before you to, to uh, avoid application of any section of the ordinance. The ordinance speaks in two different sections, 1517A and 1517B, of connections to the sewer system. 
15.17 B, which we're here under, talks of a petition to the town council for an extension under some circumstances. It requires the application by the, num by, uh, the owners of two-thirds of the lots. The owners of these lots are Janice and Ed Drynan, and they are before you as applicants. Uh, I think we are entitled to make that petition. I think the ordinance is entirely clear on that. Um, you are not obliged to grant it, although we hope you will, for reasons which I think become compelling when you look at the evidence in front of you. It is not at all clear to me that this creates any kind of precedent for reasons that will also be clear, because one of the things you must consider in granting this petition is whether it will exceed the contract capacity of the Northern Cape system. This will not. If it were to do so, you would have to deny it. It comes close enough to that capacity so that I suggest to you that the, the room for precedential value is really very, very limited. Uh, if this request is granted, most, although not all, of that capacity may well be consumed. Certainly it's not accurate, I think, to say that this request will necessarily lead to a host of others. This request has to be considered on its own merits. That's fair. The request is before you. The ordinance gives you the power to decide. It gives the Board of Zona of Sewer Appeals the power to advise you, which it has done, and asks you to look at the evidence that you have. I should say that the the information in front of you, the statistical information, isn't, to my knowledge, disputed by anyone. We've been over it with Mike McGovern. We've been over it with the town engineer. Everyone agrees that the numbers are what they are. Since the issue has been in front of you before, I won't go into great detail about what's involved. Suffice it to say that this proposal is in an area of the Cape which is served by the South Portland sewage treatment plant under a contract with South Portland that Cape Elizabeth's entitlement under the contract is to 500,000 gallons per day average over the course of a 12-month period. That into that system goes existing lots. Into that system may go fill-in lots at some time. And also into that system will go, if you approve, uh, the, the uh, sewage uh, outlets that the Drynans propose. So we provided you, or Mr. Drynan provided you with a graph last time round showing the amount of the existing usage and adding to that the amount of all the fill-in proposed and pending lots and adding to that the amount of sewage that would come out of the Drynan proposal and comparing that to the contract capacity. Now there are several observations to be made about that, that graph information which I think is attached to the application that came to you in July. One is that we have included every possible gallon of outflow from every possible fill-in lot. And it is probably unlikely that every lot in Cape Elizabeth will be filled in in the northern section. It could happen, and for that reason we've included it. We wanted to give you as full and conservative a statistical picture as possible. But it seems likely that some of those lots will remain extra lots. Uh, they will increase the acreage of people who own them now, and they simply won't be sold. It also seems possible that some of the subdivision projects now pending will not be completed. The amount of flowage from the Drynan proposal is fixed. It shows there on the graph. Uh, you will also see at the top of the graph the 500,000 gallon per day level. You will see that in one instance out of the nine reported, adding all those numbers together goes over the top by some few units. I should point out to you, and, and Mr. Hunter has done the same in his letter to you from the town engineer, I should point out to you that in that period, uh, Cape Elizabeth and this whole area had what was the highest rainfall for the 116 years during which uh, weather records have been kept in Portland. Uh, it was an extraordinary season. Even statistically, it's certainly a 100-year kind of fall. And the infiltration that affects the system, which may be as much as 50% of the flow, obviously is affected by that rainfall. In fact, if you were to look at the rainfall statistics for those nine measuring periods, you would see that the amount of total flow into the Cape Elizabeth system varies directly with the amount of rainfall. 
as one might expect. I ought to point out to you uh, in this context what you probably already know, which is that although it's accurate, as Ms. As Ms. Fritz said, to suggest that infiltration may increase as the sewers get older, it's also accurate to say that the Cape is now in the midst of an infiltration reduction program, that uh, new, new construction does not put uh, rainfall infiltration into the system, that as I walked in here tonight, I saw that the, uh, the downspouts from City Hall no longer lead to stormwater drains underneath the building which go into the system, and I understand that, this, that there is a concerted effort throughout the town to reduce the amount of infiltration. I expect that to continue, and I expect that infiltration will not have uh, the effect in the future that it has had in the past. All of this information was in front of the uh, Board of Sewer Appeals, which heard the matter twice, as you have. Heard it first uh, at your request when the, uh, I'm sorry, before it was presented to you and acted in an advisory capacity at that point. Heard it again when the request was reduced in size by the Drynes. That board recommended unanimously to you that the project be approved. I believe you have received, certainly I have seen, a letter from one member of the board suggesting that that action was wrongly taken. I'm, I'm sorry that that comes before you in that manner. It seems to me uh, somewhat less than fair to the applicant for a member of the board who heard it and who in fact uh, the same member who proposed the motion which was unanimously passed to uh, circularize this council with second thoughts. He's entitled to his second thoughts. But surely the place for that discussion was at the Board of Sewer Appeals and not in after-the-fact letters. Even if uh, that gentleman's vote had been against the recommendation, instead of being unanimous, it would have been four to one, and certainly strongly in favor of this proposal. The Board of Sewer Appeals presumably has expertise in this area and experience in this area. That's why such matters are given to it for advice. That's why presumably you referred the matter to the board. and I urge you to take its recommendation very seriously. The issue on, <clears throat> on the law and the ordinance is one which Mr. Leahy has addressed to you in a letter um, and which Ms. Fritz spoke of earlier. I think it is central to my understanding of how the law works and how all of us are, are guided by it, that we are entitled to have fair notice of what is proper for us to do and what is not proper for us to do. I challenge any of you to read section 1517B of this ordinance and to say that this petition is improper. I think it is clearly proper. There would be no reason for that section of the ordinance except for situations like this. These petitioners are before you pursuant to an ordinance which tells them they can be here. Now, the obligation you have is to decide whether to grant or to deny. You may not grant if it, if it is clear to you that the contract capacity will be exceeded. The Board of Sewer Appeals has recommended that you grant, has conceded that there is a slight possibility of running over the top. But if you look historically and fairly at that evidence, I think you will see that it's very difficult to conclude that that risk is one that has any magnitude at all. If we thought that this were a request for waiver, we would not be here. If we thought that we were not entitled to be here, we wouldn't waste our time or yours. We believe that we are entitled to petition you. We believe we're entitled to make the case as we've made it before the board. We urge you to, ex to accept that recommendation. Mr. Drennan and I are both happy to answer questions, uh, as, and it may be, may be so that the chairman of the Board of Sewer Appeals will do the same. Um, Ed, is there anything else you wanted to add? Thank you for your attention. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Yes, Councilor Amber. Uh, yes, I have a question for Attorney Lott. Uh, what I sat through all of the sewer discussion and the reports of the advisory committee that Carol reported on, and indeed, we thought when we drafted this ordinance that we would it would not permit undeveloped area outside of what was defined as fill and fill to become part of the sewer. 
And so that's why when I read section 17, uh, what is it? 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. <coughs> To me, that says that where it, where it says in the first sentence that any one or more property owners, builders, or developers may propose the extension of any sanitary sewer within the town leading to a sewage treatment plant by presenting to the town council a petition, therefore, signed by the owners of at least two thirds of the building and property. To me, that says that's a developed area. And that's really what we intended to write into this section was that we knew there were some streets that had been left off the sewer that were marginal and maybe should have been included. But because the uh, uh, townspeople wanted a downsized uh, treatment plant, we had to leave off some, some streets that we thought probably <coughs> and within a number of years we're going to be asking to be on the sewer. So we wanted to be able to provide a, a vehicle for those developed areas that might experience problems during the lifetime of the treatment plant to be able to petition for an extension. So by including the words two-thirds of the buildings and properties, I, I felt that that covered an established area, not a new area coming <coughs> in. Uh, to ask for an extension. I understand the argument, and, and I, I have heard it from people who've been directly involved uh, or involved historically in the past. Um, what I think I have to say to you is that the ordinance, as I read it, does not have that limitation anywhere. It says that if you are a property owner, and if you get the owners of two thirds of the lots which would be eligible to connect under 1514 to sign. All right. It doesn't say all. But I, your suggestion is that it must be a property with a building on right. it? Well, I simply don't read it that way. I think that that's not, you know, the owners of the buildings and properties, the owners of the buildings, the owners of the properties um, who petition. No, because there are some streets that have many buildings and maybe there'll be an empty lot. Mm -hmm. So there would be an owner of a property plus the owner of the buildings on property. In a I understand the point. I, I think it would be hard to argue that you must have one building owner in there. Let's say you had, under, under your suggestion, an existing developed street and you have three lots side by side, none of which has a building on them. Uh, I don't think, even under your interpretation, you'd turn it down if those three owners came in without a building owner in their company. Yes, Councillor Masterton. Thank you. Well, uh, <coughs> I'm going to give a little historical note, too, because I served on the Sewer Study Committee, which retorted in 1984 with this facility plan. This was after the first, first uh, referendum when we realized that we would have to scale down the project in order for it to be acceptable to the people. And we really looked into the reasons why citizens voted against the first sewer plan. One of the big reasons was fear of growth, that it would encourage growth, a sophisticated and expanded sewer uh, facility. One of the things, have you read this facility plan? I've read much of it. I don't think I it's could say I'd guard. read all of it. It's high guard, I will admit. But you will remember that one of the things that uh, we paid soil scientists to do was to look at the soil, to look at the conditions, and in, in, this is in the Southern Cape, to look at the conditions, to test the soil, and make projections as to what areas in the Southern Cape most needed the sewering. Some of the original areas, like Westfield down by um, Great Pond, were dropped off uh, because it appeared that with scientific investigation, we could get away without sewering those areas. Certainly the most critical areas like Shore Acres and Broad Cove, just to mention two areas, uh, it was decided that they critically needed sewerage. And that was the premise on which we proceeded, that the critically, the critically polluted areas 
difficult soils, etc., were where the sewers were going to go. Um, once this was established, a sort of boundaries were set up in which fill-in growth could occur. It hadn't occurred because the soils were too poor in certain lots. But we did have boundaries. There was a map of the Southern Cape Sewer. Now, I know we're talking about the Northern Cape Sewer, but one of the issues that the Sewer Study Committee discussed and that this council uh, discussed when it came time to assess fees, sewer user fees, was that we wanted one sewer system. We weren't going to do something in the Northern Cape and do something different in the Southern Cape. So I would conclude that the policies that we had set up for the Southern Cape system also applied to the Northern. I agree with what Carol Fritz said. I agree with what Jane Amaro has said. There was never any intention, either by the council or by the sewer study committee that I served on, when we talk about the word expansion, to go outside the boundaries that have already been set up for a sewer district and to allow development of brand new land that was heretofore undeveloped. When we talked about fill-in growth and the advisory committee, too. We were talking about within the boundaries of the sewer district in lots that were previously undevelopable because of poor soil conditions. That's what we intended. That's what I think we are reading into that 15-1 whatever that Jane read, part of the ordinance. Let me respond in a couple of ways, Ms. Masterton. Um, first, as you pointed out, we are here in the northern system, and there is a limit on what can be done in the northern system. There is, in fact, a limit on what can be done in the southern system because of the capacity and the stated gallonages in the ordinance of the southern plant. But for the northern system, perhaps it's clearer because it's a contract capacity with a neighboring municipality. And I think for that reason, it's difficult to say that granting this petition will open the floodgates. You can't. There's a ceiling. There's a point where it has to stop. Second, and more generally, and I think more importantly, I don't believe that it's the obligation of citizens of the town who have in front of them a clearly worded ordinance to determine what was intended by it if that intention is not clear from the ordinance itself. Now, people can differ in how clear they think the ordinance is. I believe that section to be very clear, and I believe that we have qualified under it for your consideration. I don't see anything in the ordinance anywhere that says to me extensions are proper in area one but not in area two. And unless there's some ambiguity in the ordinance itself, I don't believe it's the obligation of a citizen to seek behind the letter of the ordinance to what was intended. So I really rest my case uh, on what the law now says to which the Drynans are to conform their conduct. And I, I have to defer to your greater experience in the proceedings that led up to it. But I think I must say to the council with respect that as I read this ordinance, it tells us that we are properly before you. Yes, Councillor Cogshaw. Would you um, have the figures of the street frontage that this lot provides to give you access for an extension? There are two areas of frontage. I think maybe Mr. Drennan can tell you that more readily than I can. And also, while he's looking at his notes, um, when this piece of land was broken off, has that been broken off recently, or when the sewer ordinance was enacted, was it defined as a separate section of land? I purchased this land prior to the enactment of the present sewer ordinance. 
The land has a total of 783 feet of frontage, street frontage. 783 feet of frontage coupled, uh, including uh, 288 feet of sewer line going through under the land. You have an easement over that section? The uh, sewer company does. Mm -hmm. The sewer district does, yes. 288 of sewer pipe under the land, and the difference between 288 and 783 is the street frontage. Mm -hmm. Okay, you purchased this land. You didn't give me the date. It was uh, prior to the most uh, recent uh, changes to the sewer ordinance, the ones that are affected by my presence here tonight. Okay, that subsection was. I believe August 86. Prior to. So you, you owned the, the actual land as a separate lot prior to the act of 86? Yes. In August of 86? Yes. Michael? Just to clarify a, a point uh, that uh, Mrs. Coggs will make. You said you had 788 feet of frontage on... on Combination frontage and uh, sewer uh, line. Uh, okay. Is I think what the requirement of the ordinance is is that the frontage needs to be on a public sewer line where there is a public road and there is in fact a sewer line on it. That's does, correct. Does your, yes, it does. Does meets that requirement? Yes, it does. So is that your 783 meets the requirement, or does that include your 288? If you uh, subtract, I don't have that. If if you subtract 288 from 783, you will get street frontage, approved streets with sewer in those streets. Okay. All right. <laughs> so ask, asking that then another way, if, you know, we went by the letter of the law of the ordinance, if this was just a regular sewer running by, you know, the, the property, how many would you be allotted based on the, <laughs> the, the requirements as they're laid out now in terms of street frontage? Well, uh, that's... Uh, uh, because of the zoning of 100 feet of uh, frontage and or sewer easement, uh, that would be a total of eight sewer units. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't have to appear before this board or any other to connect eight sewer units there. Those are entitlements. Those eight are included, for instance, in fill-in growth. Mm -hmm. okay. Any further questions? Mr. Drynan or Mr. Martin? No. In that case, we'll continue on with the public hearing on item 33. Mr. Chairman, members of the council, my name is John Roberts, and I'm a member of the sewer uh, committee. I hadn't planned on speaking, however, in light of Mr. Martin's comments, I felt perhaps I better explain what I had done and why I have done it. Uh, originally, I made the motion to deny the request for an extension of the sewer based on the street frontage and the two sections that have been cited. I still feel that that should be the basis for the decision. However, when that was denied or overruled five to one, uh, no one else was prepared to make a motion. So I made the motion to grant it based on the flow, which does appear to grant the uh, right for, for the uh, extension on that basis only. I still feel strongly that if that's not the issue at hand, in the future, I have lear I've learned my lesson in the future. When I make one motion to deny, I'll let someone else make the motion uh, to follow it. Uh, it has put me in a kind of a, an awkward situation, but since I made the motion to grant on the flow, I felt that I ought to at least vote for it. Um, if that has caused any problems for the council or the board, I apologize, and it won't happen again. Thank you very much. Other further public comment on item 33 that's before us this evening? Yes. I am Alice Roy. I'm chairman of the planning board, and uh, I, too, had not planned uh, to speak, but uh, I found it irresistible to <laughs> come and make a few comments. Uh, sitting on the planning board, uh, I think that we are overwhelmed over and over again with the cumulative impact of extending, fill-in, uh, and I don't, I guess I don't uh, dispute the, um, 
the authority of Mr. Drine to come before you in a, in a petition form, but I do feel very uncomfortable um, as a member of the community and as a member of the planning board looking down the road to see what is going to take place in the future. We do have a large uh, development that will probably come before us on the corner of Woodland and Mitchell Road, and, and there are others um, that, that surely will come before us. I think it's an invitation, uh, and a very strong invitation, if you uh, grant this. And I would urge you strongly to deny it. Um, and I would just bring up one other point. These are two separate parcels. Can you add the frontage of those two separate parcels? Would you consider that? Just a question. Thank you. Is there any other public comment now on item 33? Yes. May I ask the, uh, the chairman of the uh, Board of Sewer Appeals, Mr. Bridges, uh, to step to the microphone? I, I have a question that I, I need clarification on. If it's possible, you could help me with that. <laughs> I'm, I have a confusion. Um, Mr. Drynan appeared before your board some months ago with a request initially of 35 units. That's right. At that point in time, the request was basically denied, I believe, by a four to one, or at least recommendation to the council was to deny the request by a four to one vote. That's correct. Mr. Drynan returned uh, to your group, uh, the Board of Sewer Appeals, some months after his first appearance uh, with his attorney and made a request for 18 units. At that point in time, after considerable discussion, your board reversed their original opinion and recommended to the council to uh, accept this request. Could you explain to me and my colleagues uh, on the council exactly what had changed in those months to reverse your recommendation? I don't think that uh anything really changed in in any of the proceedings that would change our minds but the way the motion was put before us was strictly a capacity motion on the capacity of this of the uh, northern cape system to accept the increased flow and that's where the motion is stated and we were it was proven to us i believe that this 18 units would not, as a rule, exceed the capacity of that system. And I believe in the uh, following motion, following this motion, we made comment on, on the uh, problems that we found with the ordinance in reading it and trying to define uh, just how we would interpret it and how we would vote on it. And I don't think we did vote on that part of it. I think we voted the way this is, is written. To me, we voted basically on the capacity on the, tre on the treatment plant itself willing to accept this increased flow. And I believe it will do that. And uh, as, as it states, as the engineer states, it may exceed that capacity once in a very, very great while, but not as a general rule of thumb. Well, you've helped me somewhat. Uh, I'm still confused in that, uh, as you speak of the, the town engineer's input, uh, Mr. Hunter, uh, my understanding, again, based on the, uh, the precise wording of the, the ordinance itself, uh, both parts, 15.1-4 and 15.1-7 uh, A and B, that the, that the town engineer is charged to certify that uh, capacity is available or not available um, basically prior to the town council rendering a vote on a request for um, this kind of uh, sewer 
uh, usage. Now, do we have a, an opinion as to, uh, and maybe I'm asking you, the, maybe I'm asking the wrong person this question, perhaps I should be uh, discussing it with the town attorney, but has this been done, basically, uh, to uh, the council's satisfaction? And I'm looking at the, uh, the letter of Mr. Hunter, dated September 1st, 1988. Uh, I guess I'm asking, do we all read this letter and agree that our town engineer has provided us with as expert an opinion uh, as possible at this uh, moment to render a vote? I'm not sure. Okay, Michael. Michael? Question yeah. Yeah, I, you do have a, a letter uh, from the town engineer dated September 1st. In that, he reviews the flow data and I, comes essentially to the conclusion that it is a judgment call. Uh, he, ha he has not, in fact, certified that there is capacity. He has not certified that there is not capacity. Uh, to, you know, a little bit of the background is he is very sensitive to prior criticism of not leaving boards room to move and coming to his own conclusions uh, with, without deferring uh, to either, in some examples, the planning board or to the town council. So he, he did not state a definitive conclusion uh, uh, essentially due to the, the prior uh, criticism uh, of him when, when he has done so. But you can interpret your letter, uh, his letter, uh, you know, how you choose. This is Mr. Hunter's bottom line. I, yeah, I think if you read uh, the next to last paragraph, uh, that really presents his conclusion. It's that it's basically a judgment decision as illustrated by the above discussion. The council must weigh the risk the town should take as the wastewater flows approach the contract limit. The drying request does not add large volumes to the system, but it does move the town closer to a possible violation. The next request for extension will raise the same issues and will be a more difficult judgment decision. Okay, thank you. Are there further questions, or is there any other, the other, any other further public comment at this time? If not, I would like to. Oh. I have a question, Mr. Dryden. Is it time to ask that? Yes, you could. I think I think if we are done with the public uh, comment, then we could start the council comment. Okay. So I will officially close the public hearing section and now throw it open to the council, and recognize you, Councilor Green. <laughs> and how many acres do these? Do this one or these two lots? I'm not. I'm hearing some people refer to one lot. I'm hearing some people refer to two lots. I'm confused about that issue and how many acres you are look you own overall. At uh, one point, I bought one lot, and at another time, another lot. The two are contiguous. I consider them one lot, uh, and it's about 26 acres. Have you undertaken or had undertaken any perk tests? or soils investigations to determine what, what soils you have. I can tell you the soils you have from the soil conservation or how many potential septic systems you would have in those 26 acres. If I intended to develop the land, I would, but I don't intend to develop the land, so I have not done that. Okay. I intend to control its development through a sale to a, a, a responsible party as I explained to you at my first uh, meeting here in April. One other issue that's come up is the fact that you are eligible for eight sewer connections with the frontage you have. And I would, I've done some calculating here and your graph, in the graph that you've presented the many number of times you've been before the various boards, some of the capacity that you're claiming your land, if it were to be developed, those eight of those units could be put into, are already, in fact, in the infill section. They're in the 46,000 gallons a day, right. which uh, includes 100% of uh, sewer connections to all possible fill-in lots. So you're counting those eight, those eight units being counted twice in some of your calculations? No, they're not being counted twice. They're being, I'm asking for an extension of 18. The eight have already been counted in fill-in growth. So you would you would proceed 26 units being developed? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, I, I would like, you know, I, I think I missed something on this. This is the first I've heard that, uh, that it was an additional 18 units. I, I am, you know, I misunderstood that. I think the town engineer misunderstood it. I'm, I can't speak for the Board of Sewer Appeals, but uh, you know, I'm not sure if when they reviewed this, they were doing it on the basis of uh, 18 plus 8 or a total of 18. I, I don't think we should get an answer from the chairman of the Board of Sewer Appeals. Sure. I if we could at this juncture on that. I thought I made it very clear that uh, when uh, the uh, questions from the Board of Sewer Appeals, and there were many regarding my right to petition and uh, regarding entitlements, and I explained many times that I was entitled to eight connections. This uh, request for an extension for 18 was above and beyond what I was entitled to. And the, enti the entitlements are uh, included in my statistics in the 46,000 gallons per day fill-in growth. They're already on the books. Could we get an answer from the, the chairman if, if through that was the understanding of the board when they voted on said matter? I uh, believe my... my uh, interpretation was that we were looking at 18 units total. And I just talked to one of my members for a second, whispered, and that was his impression, too. I believe that was our impression of the whole board, because we were talking at 30, I don't remember what the number was on the first one. And I thought that included everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yes, Councilor Creel. Well, you know, this is a, a very complicated issue. It's, it's obviously uh, a very, very important issue. Um, is it appropriate at this point to uh, to make a motion? Uh, I'm asking for your advice, Frank, to to table this issue uh, with a request for our town engineer to be crystal clear with regard to the number of units we're talking about as it's clear that there's been a confusion with regard to the recommendation that we've received from the uh, Board of Sewer Appeals. Mr. Chairman, yes. you can't debate a tabling motion. You, you, did you make an actual motion? Well, I asked the possibility. I asked for the possibility of uh, tabling this to get further input. Thus, I didn't I'm not sure if that's a t actually a tabling motion. But you can't discuss tabling. You got to do it, and then discuss it afterwards. Go ahead, Wayne. Well, make the I'll make the motion. Uh, as stated. So now we cannot discuss it further what, whatsoever. Is there a second? New one. Yes, Nancy seconded. Vote it up or down. All those in favor of tabling this motion this evening, please signify by saying aye. Or raising your hand, please. Oh, all those opposed to tabling? Proceeding onward um, with, with that, I would like to ask Carol Fritz, who was on the uh, recent Sewer Advisory Commission, just, just for my own background and once again to clarify in my mind, if the discussion came up regarding saving some capacity for possible, possible failures within the Northern Cape system or within the Southern Cape system as well. And just to refresh my memory on I know that there's filling growth where we're saving some capacity, but, but in terms of public policy decisions, what, what was looked at in terms of those which could possibly fail due to their geographic conditions and, and et cetera, ecological conditions? Was there any mention of that in the discussions or I, do, you I, do you feel personally that some should be left in light of that some may fail or, or what's your comments on that, that issue? I remember it very similar to what Nancy had mentioned, um, that there was a recognition that we were leaving out areas that were marginal, um, that Cape Elizabeth is difficult with septic systems, um, and that if we ran into a situation, if, if we ever determined that the amount saved aside for infiltration and stormwater was far more than we needed, that that should be saved, not, not for new developments, but for any problems that came up instead of the, the sort of situation we had in Shore Acres and Broad Cove where we had 
uh, ditches with, with open sewage in them, um, that, that that should be what the capacity was allowed for, that anything that was undeveloped should be um, placed on, on septic systems and mm -hmm. that we have ordinances that were strictly controlling that. Uh, if I could just comment on the um, uh, Mr. Dryden and Mr. Martin's in interpreting Bob Hunter as saying that there is capacity now, um, I think that the interpretation of the, study, the advisory committee was that you know you fairly allocate out what was fill in growth and that yes there may be capacity now but if you allot it to someone in an unfair share someone else is not going to have the capacity they are really entitled to because they front the sewer <coughs> uh, I think that's really an important fairness issue that you need to consider thank you very much I'd also like to ask at this juncture if I might our town attorney to come forward and speak in terms of a couple of, of uh, sentences that he wrote in our letter, that in the letter that he wrote to the town manager, which we've been all copied here on the council. And what he did in this letter, I thought, was was uh, attempt to explain to us or put into his perspective the difference, again, between 1517A and 1517B, which are critical to the discussion here this evening. So would you care to amplify further on on those points? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think. I would, and I just want to take one liberty here to emphasize uh, an advice that I gave the Sewer Study Committee uh, when we were working with the ordinance, and that was that uh, it's my conclusion that once you sewer an existing area, you have to always sue that sewer that area. What that means is when somebody pays for sewage or pays a readiness to serve charge and they're on a sewer line, that whatever may happen in the future, the town will be legally obligated to sewer. If it runs out of capacity, it must buy capacity, it must build capacity, it must rehab capacity or correct infiltration. I say that because it's not simply a matter of fairness to people who are paying uh, to be on the sewer and even though they don't connect at this time. Uh, it's not, it is an issue of fairness perhaps, but it's, it's something I want you to realize because, um, I mean, it's, it's that serious. Once somebody is on, they're on. You can't say, well, you paid for five years, therefore you're we're well, sorry, but it's, it's not there today. On the sections, I think that uh, uh, two lawyers here uh, perhaps disagree as to the interpretation of the sections. Uh, my view is perhaps colored because I worked with the ordinance for a number of years with the sewer study committee. <coughs> Fill and growth is the shorthand term that we use, and that is set forth in the eligibility sections of the ordinance. That's 15, 1, 4, B, and C. B says who's eligible. C says, if you're eligible for more than one, this is how many you're eligible for. Now, I think that you have to start there, and then you go to 1517, which speaks in terms of extensions. While the applicant or the petitioner feels that it's clear under 1517B that he's entitled to be before you, I think there's a very reasonable argument that he should stop at 1517A. And that says if someone is to subdivide land in Cape Elizabeth and wants or doesn't want a sewer extension, 1517A says he shall place a sewer extension. He shall run a sewer extension. And he shall do so for the exact number of units that he's eligible for under the previous eligibility provisions. So I don't see, and I also agree with uh, Council Amro's uh, comments that I think the beginning sentence of 1517B supports that. But I think if you just stop at 1517A, it says when anyone proposes to subdivide, he shall extend the sewer for that many eligible units. Now, it may be that it's eight in this instance, which means eight are sewered, and however many he can place on the land that's unsewered by a private septic system, that is the way I would interpret it to be. I think otherwise of uh, you will have the fill and growth provisions of 1514 that that kind of sewers that lot that has frontage and if a single applicant comes before you that's all you can give him is that many units for which he has eligibility by frontage 
and then have a different standard if the person says, well, I don't want that, I want to go behind and do the rest. I want an extension. I don't want eligibility, I want an extension. I think, at least I think a reasonable reading of it is that you don't have to go beyond 1517A. Um, 17B could easily be read as eligible for those um, areas where there are existing buildings, and if I recall, this council approved a, I think it was on Pine Ridge Road, an extension at one point in time to meet existing uh, concerns about uh, private septic systems. Uh, obviously, we wanted one, uh, I think one thing that's very difficult, maybe I'm just stating the obvious, is that we got to fill in growth in those provisions by first looking at the capacity. The limited capacity of the Southern Cape system only addressed existing problems, fill and growth, and infiltration. Uh, after that, we're out of capacity. And it wasn't designed for, for new additional capacity. It was addressed existing problems. That's been repeated a number of times. In South Portland, we looked at the contract and we looked at the history, and it had been exceeded. I don't know how many times you need to exceed, but it was my judgment, and I think the, the sewer study committee's judgment, that we were sufficiently at capacity in order to apply the fill-in growth and have one uniform ordinance for all of Cape Elizabeth. Um, I think what's difficult here is that those ordinances, the fill and growth and the eligibility, presuppose that we're virtually at capacity. Um, I too share Councillor Cremont's uh, concern that the ordinance specifically states that you can only allow an extension if you have a certification from the town engineer that there is capacity. Uh, I have to. Uh, uh, identify a little bit with Mr. Hunter's position of trying to say whether there is or isn't. It's just, it's been exceeded in the past. If Mr. Drynan's units were in there, it would have been exceeded in the past. Not usually, but it would have. Is that, you know, does that mean we're at capacity? Some would say yes, obviously, and I think Mr. Martin said it's in your discretion tonight to determine that. Uh, and that really is a judgment call, and I can't take that away from you, but I I feel uncomfortable with that certification as well. He did not say clearly this capacity. He said it's been exceeded and, in, 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 uh, well, I guess there's some discretion or some disagreement whether it's one or two times depending on the accounting periods, but at least one or more times it has been exceeded in the past under certain circumstances. So if it helps, I think there are two issues. There's a legal issue as to whether under the ordinance uh, it's even before you. Uh, I didn't do a, uh, an awful lot of research on it, but I, I went through the provisions and I saw what I thought was intended. New subdivisions in A, other areas under B. That was consistent with fill and growth and with eligibility. Uh, I think you may get to the same conclusion by looking at capacity, but that's certainly a judgment call uh, for you to make. Uh, I guess, if, I don't know if that addressed Yes, the very specifically very well. uh, your concern. That's right. Mm -hmm. My comments. Any other questions? Any questions of our attorney? Yes. I have a question. You just said something that I find not in the ordinance. You said proposed. You said about new subdivisions. I don't see the word new. In it says any person who. Fifteen one seven A, the first clause says any person who proposes to subdivide a lot of land. I understand Mr. Drynan to be a person who proposes to subdivide that lot of land that he has. He is he is a subdivider or in anticipation of a subdivider coming before you. And uh, this would in indicate to me how many that he must do an extension, he must sewer eight units, if that is the number of units by street frontage. Um, I think the question is whether that's mutually exclusive of B. I read it that it is, maybe it's not, but I think that's the way, as I indicated to uh, 
in my letter to the uh, Sewer Appeals Board, that was my, uh, that's my interpretation. Um. My problem is that I do not find that these are mutually exclusive. And I have discussed this with a number of people. That, you know, if the intent were clearly written as part of the ordinance, I don't think we'd be having the confusion that I'm experiencing anyway. I don't find the intent statement, the purpose statement, at the beginning of this ordinance helpful to me in my dilemma. <clears throat> Helping me differentiate between 1517A and 1517B. I think the wording is not yeah. as concise and precise well, as it would, could be to help me anyway. I apologize for that. One of the, just by way of an excuse, perhaps, one of the problems we always work with is we have an existing ordinance. This is not all new. You know, you, you, we come into it and we say, well, what do we need to fix because of this provision? And we go in and we, we leave the rest intact. We don't start afresh. Uh, that, is, that is part of the problem. One section was done in 86, one was done in 87, 88. Um, the, uh, you know, but that, that is part of the problem is that we're, we're patching it as we go along. This, these basic provisions were in your sewer ordinance when the policy of Cape Elizabeth was to sewer everything it could. Everything that was within the realm should be picked up. After that became the fill and growth provisions and the eligibility provisions. It was just a different philosophy, if you will, that, that started um, being you know, inserted into the ordinance in different provisions. But some of the older provisions are still there. I, I can't say that it's free, of, free from doubt. I don't disagree that it's not free from doubt, as, as Mr. Martin would say. I think that's a reasonable reading of it, that one says if you're a subdivider and you request, then you're under, under A. I think that as a policy matter, you know, again, you can still come to the same conclusion on capacity. That's, that's really uh, uh, the second issue, a separate issue from the legal issue is the capacity issue. If you, if you agree with Mr. Martin, in other words, you still have the capacity issue to address whether they have met that burden, if you will, to establish to your satisfaction that there's capacity there in light of your duty to continue to sewer what you are now sewering and what is uh, called the fill and growth eligibility lots. Thank you. Are there any other questions by the town council of our town attorney? Yes, Councilor Jordan. I've been very quiet. <laughs> because I'm on the other side of this issue. I don't agree with these people that have come forth and said that we should already sue with the street frontage and those eligibility lots. I say years ago, they built a septic system. They said it would carry forever, but they found they failed. Now they revised it and they have larger systems and what have you. I think someday in the future, they're gonna fail and your children, grandchildren, and beyond are going to have to wrestle with this dilemma again because we didn't make the real decision to pick up all possibilities as we went along. And the council previously tried to uh, control growth by adding just a small treatment plant. The issue here, as far as I'm concerned with Dryden, is whether the capacity is there for him to go into the salt pool and treatment. And as I read <coughs> Mr. Hunter's letter, I can get a yes and no out of it. And uh, that's what I call a typical professional answer. Uh, but as, as I look at the numbers there, I, I think the room is there for him to do that. What bothers me tonight is everything I've read up until tonight is for 18 units. Now, as I sit here very quietly, I find I should be thinking about 26 units as far as capacity goes. The question that I have from somebody is the capacity figures here for 18 units or 26 units? Yes, Mr. Martin. The figures that you have include 26 units. Eight are included in the existing fill-in figures. They are part of already scheduled sewer. The additional 18 are what's represented in the graph by the last section of the book. This 4,860 gallons includes
includes 18 or 26? That's 18. That's 18. The, other eight the others are what? Generator and 46,000 gallons down below. I didn't get it that way, that's all. So I'm kind of on the other side of the issue. I feel you know, I can read this both ways, that he has a right to do it. And the sewer appeal for it, I think, is in a problem of their own because there's an item further beyond here that we should try to straighten out and clean up the ordinance. So I, I don't know. I'm just still unclear with uh, the Bob Hunter's letter on the capacity there or not. And uh, I think that the problem, whichever, if we don't go the right way, I'll get a subpoena today for one other problem. I'll probably be getting another one. So let's vote for the issue. Okay. Thank you. Is there other uh, discussion or questions from any of the people that are here in the audience for, from the council? If not, would, would someone like to continue the discussion here regarding, as we bring this to a vote? Councilor Amro. Uh, I'd like at this time to make a motion. Uh, <coughs> and I would move that the request for uh, Mr. Dryan's request be denied. I'll second. So we moved and seconded that the uh, request for the additional sewering extension be denied, and it has been seconded. Further discussion on the, the motion now before us. I believe, I, I would just offer my comments, and I think they've been extremely well versed on both sides, they've been explained here this evening. I would just say that in my deliberations, in my study with this over the weekend, and as I've looked at the history of it, I would also conclude that what is the applicable ordinance here is 1517A. I think that addresses the specific case of what to do when a lot is being subdivided. I also agree that B is regarding existing property. I believe it's structured similar in a way that 1514D is structured, where you're talking about those one particular scenario and then another of, of those existing and how that could fit into the to the situation. And I have that that is the number one way that I feel, but I also have tremendous problems with the capacity if I go to the capacity issue as well, knowing that even though it is as we keep saying here, only two of sixteen times that we have violated and gone over capacity, that concerns me. I don't know how we can attach the, the adjective only two to something as, as absolutely critical as this. And as Tom Leahy said, if the system specifically was designed such that we were up at existing capacity, that's how we determine this entire thing to begin with. So if we say, well, now we're only going to violate it three of 16 times, I personally, as a responsible public official, don't want to violate it any times. And if this brings us that precariously close to that situation, I, I just don't see how I could vote in favor of it. So I would, I would be voting also in favor of the motion to deny. Those are my comments. Councilor Amor? Uh, yes, I would agree with everything that you just said. Uh, and from my reading, I would interpret it the same way you do. However, that may be because I was immersed in this uh, during, during the time when it was being drafted. So if other people are finding it unclear, I would like to have it reviewed by the audience committee uh, to make it clear what the intent is, if it's not clear to some people at this point. It is clear to me, and that's how I, and that's why I, I'm going to vote to deny. And that's, aren't, yes, that, that will be coming up for further discussion. Other comments? Yes, Council Greenlaw. Mr. Chairman, I, too, spent my weekend with this. <laughs> Wonderful to become so well acquainted with these ordinances over a weekend period. That goes with the job, and I usually enjoy it. I believe I'm agreeing with Councilor Jordan in reading this petition to fall correctly under Section 1517B. I don't think the legal wording is in this ordinance to not hear it under that section of the ordinance. It is not clearly enough spelled out for me to not consider this under 1517B. That then brings us to the capacity issue. And I've grappled with that. I've done calculations on it. It's something I deal with professionally. I believe there's enough capacity to accommodate what Mr. Dryan is petitioning for. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there further discussion on this item? If not, I would call for a vote then on the motion before us, which is to deny the request from Edward and Janice Drynan for a sewer extension. All those in favor of the motion? Opposed? So it, the motion passes four to three. And thank everyone for coming and, and giving their side of the, of the story here. It was a very full hour and a half discussion, and we thank you for this type of, of debate. Yes. Yes, we're, we're, I'm now going to have a 10-minute recess, and we will be back with you in 10 minutes. Okay. Seventh inning stretch. Okay, we are ready to resume uh, the town council meeting here this evening after a brief recess. And we're going to resume with item 34, which is a uh, request from the Board of Sewer Appeals recommending the Town Council review possible ambiguities in the sewer ordinance and take any necessary action. And I would uh, ask the Town Manager, Mike McGovern, to make a few comments. After the discussion of the last hour or so, I don't think I have to explain why the Board of Sewer Appeals asked to have this item on the agenda. Uh, they did suggest the Town Council look at it if, if there is a feeling at all that it might be ambiguous. And if you do feel that, you might want to refer this to the Ordinance Committee to have them take a look at it. Thank you very much. I'll make a motion to refer it to the Ordinance Second. It's been moved and seconded that uh, it be referred back to the Ordinance Committee, for the sewer ordinance be referred to the Ordinance Committee to check for, to look for ambiguities. All those in favor of the motion? Any opposed? Passes unanimously. <laughs> 